Hello, good afternoon. Again, thank you so much for the invitation. It's uh, always an honor to speak in my home country, so I'm, I'm very excited to be back in Egypt for this talk. Today I'm going to speak on the management of large and massive irreparable rotator cuff tears. Here are my disclosures. So, at least in the United States, four to six million people a year are going to show up in our clinics to have some type of procedure done. So it's very important that we have an understanding of the natural history of rotator cuff tears as well as what we're going to do for these patients. We need to understand the anatomy and the most important part here is this level, this layer five. This is the superior capsule that over the last few years has become very popular in understanding. And we can see in this delaminated tear that that inferior portion, that superior capsule, has no chance of getting all the way lateral. That actually needs to go to the medial footprint. So it's important that we understand that so that we don't over tension these and have those failures at the myotendinous junction, which is going to lead to even bigger issues with these rotator cuff tears. We've gone through many of these today, but today we're gonna to concentrate on the large to massive and then irreparable. We need to understand the footprint, where that tendon needs to come back to and be positioned. We need to position this appropriately so that that tendon is able to restore normal function. We have this menu of different things we can offer these patients from conservative all the way to replacement. But if there is a way we could help predict what happens to these tears when we fix them, Christian Gerber's group looked at these at 33 patients, looked at the tendon length, and found that if that patient had at least grade two or three fatty infiltration with only a 15 millimeter tendon, there was a 92% chance of failure. And even with greater than 15 millimeters and no fatty infiltration, there was still about a 25% failure rate. So we have to look at the sagittal view, the, the T1 sagittal view, because I think it's important. Just like if we went to dinner, we would never want to order that steak on the right. We would want the one on the left. Same in surgery. If we look at that steak, we, we know that that's probably not the one that we want to fix. So we correlate this to the Gautelier classification. Peter Chalmers and his group actually created this app looking at 2,500 patients through multiple studies and looking at the possibility of repair and understanding that with age, gender, osteoporosis, the work activity, the tendon size, and the, whether it was, there was any associated um, class, uh, fatty infiltration, you could actually calculate what type of chance you had for success. Does age make a difference? Well, it does. The younger patients do better. So the sooner we address these, the better. If we're looking at an 85-year-old patient with a large tear, chances are that's not one that we want to fix. Same, this study shows that these patients with greater than 60 years of age, initial tear size that was large and fatty infiltration, had a worse prognosis. So the younger and the better the tissue, the better they do. It seems pretty clear. Does smoking make a difference? And yes, it does. We know that the non-smokers are more likely to heal and get less stiff. So this is important that we address this with these patients. In Michigan, where I am, there's a, it, it's a cold climate, obviously, it's different than here. We have sun here every day, not in Michigan. So many of these patients get vitamin D deficiency and go on to osteoporosis. And these patients that have osteoporosis have a 23% chance of failure with all, all size tears. Again, with diabetes, this is another one. We have more signs of adhesive capsulitis, 16% to 4%, retears of 26% to 15%, and then any complication, 35% to 22%. So it's important that we address these and talk to our patients about having controlled diabetes if that's something we can adjust. Doxycycline has been shown to be helpful and not only healing of the tendon, but also preventing infection. So it, not only am I getting an added benefit with giving this postoperatively 100 uh, milligrams twice a day for 14 days, but it also increases their chance of tendon healing as a side effect. This is with the vitamin D deficiency. The histology shows that the less bone formation also leads to less collagen formation, therefore a weaker uh, attachment at the enthesis site of the repair. Lipids, so with hyperlipidemia, again, with this correlates with fatty infiltration. The higher their lipid content, the higher their fatty infiltration, and therefore the less likely for healing and the higher uh, likelihood of recurrent tear. When you look at this slide, they looked at all comers, and this is out of HSS in New York City, and they found that increased age, increased male, uh, had a higher risk of revision, smoking, high risk of revision, obesity, hyperlipidemia, vitamin D deficiency, 
was high risk of revision. Interestingly, diabetes did not have a high risk of revision, but these were probably because they were more stiff and less likely to tear. So when we look at all, all comers, it's a busy slide, but I'll sum it up. Small to medium still fail about one in four. Large, one in two, and massive about 60% of the time. So what are we doing and how are we doing it? I'm not sure is, is the real question. I think we need more biology. So we've discussed PRP, but however, with 33 systems out there, no one really knows which one's doing what, and there is no evidence that shows that it really helps. Some show that it does, some show that it doesn't. So I think we need better studies to understand if PRP really makes a difference. And how do we assess the healing? We can use uh, the Sagaya classification to assess this so that we can all speak the same language, especially here in a different country. For me, I want to be able to communicate this to you, so we'll use the Sagaya classification. And then what, what about repairs and augmentation? Augmentation here in this Italian paper, 2.4% failure uh, versus 41% failure in the control group with no augmentation. In this randomized pr uh, prospective study, again, zero tears in the allograft group, 9% tears in the allograft group with incomplete coverage. So going back to the single row, double row, does it make a difference to get healing when you have the full uh, tuberosity covered? Well, in this paper, it says that it does. Again, onlay augmentation, are we going to do something like dermal graft, or are we just going to use the crimson duvet to try to get some biological uh, parameters there to help with our repair? What about debriding and partial repair? Well, here the problem that we see is it's still about 52% failure rate with partial repair. So are we really giving these patients a chance when we do the partial repairs? What about what else is out there? So Regenitin is a proprietary product, and this shows that in some of these patients, in this one out of New Orleans, 96% healing rate with large tears with this patch over it. What about something at the Enthesis site? This is a small company out of the Midwest in, in uh, the U.S. And this actually showed that just placing this in an interpositional area here would help with the healing. This is a short video. If it plays. It's not going to play. Uh, but that will help at the Enthesis site. This is from ConMed now, uh, pri previously BioRes. And this, I'm not sure if it's in the uh, Middle East yet, but it's on its way. And this is something that I've started to use, which not only gives me biologics by holding it all there, but also gives me strength at time zero. So this is helpful because this is going to allow to keep some of those orthobiologics at the repair site. At six weeks, it shows that these fibroblasts uh, and regularly oriented collagen connective tissue are helping with the healing. By 12 weeks, it's helping remodel. And over the next 12 to 24 months, it will resorb, leaving just the tendon. And so what it does is we can put it on the top of that repair through our sutures or, or however you would like to secure it. And what that does is it compresses the repair, gives biology, and also give, keeps some uh, biologics at that site. So this is one quick video that we can show. I'll just speed it up just for simplicity's sake. Are you able to speed that up for me? Okay. They're busy. Uh, what about uh, dermal allograft? Dermal allograft has been shown that it can help, it can give strength, but the problem with dermal graft, it doesn't really do anything. It remains as skin, and we'll show that in a, in a few minutes. So when you're looking at all these different biologics and synthetics, we have to decide what we want and what we need, and so we can cater it for that each particular patient. SCR has become very popular. However, we're starting to see that this is not what we once thought. As you can see there, the uh, superior capsule is very medial, and that's going to attach to that medial footprint. we got to make sure that when we pull that over, we're not trying to pull it over laterally. Is that, that's actually just a recipe for a failure. But when we look at what Mahata talked about, he talked about this thick piece of tissue that's going to be helpful in healing. And he indicated it for stage 1 and 2. He did not want to do it in the arthritic patients. And the contraindications are the more arthritic patients. But one of the most important parts of this is that we do 18... We, will do a side-to-side -side repair and margin convergence to the infraspinatus. That's the most important part of this procedure to reverse that superior migration and restore that tamponade effect on that humeral head. Biomechanically, it's important to remember that this is a large piece of tissue. So trying to use a piece of skin, as we've been told we should do, doesn't really help us. And in some countries that don't have allograft, this is probably beneficial. As when Mahada did this, he took a piece of tensor fasciolata folded it on itself, so I think there's a spacing effect there as well 
to push that humeral head down. In the papers that we see, we don't really see really great outcomes. This is only essentially eight pa or 23 patients in this Mahata, but he did restore better range of motion and forward flexion. In this, with an acerodermal graft with Harahar, he only had eight patients, two of which failed. So again, 25% failure rate in this particular study. Uh, in this one, level 300 patients, this again with, uh, with uh, tensor fasciolata, 16% complication rate, although the motion and function was a little bit better here. Again, with Denard's group, this was interesting as they only had 45% that actually showed that there was an acromial humeral interval change, meaning most of these went up into superior migration with only 67% satisfaction rate in these patients. He had 11 failures in this group, and so most of these went on to have a subsequent procedure. Pennington showed us that although the, the patients got a little bit better on paper, many were satisfied, but many returned for a revision procedure. So what we started to see is that in these patients, it was more appropriate to have a taller graft. So whether you're using an allograft, I think you need a bigger one, or if you're using an autograft, make sure it's tall enough. So the conclusions in 2023 is that it's technically challenging. May, skin may not be the best option here, and the primary repair is our first goal. This is one that we just recently took out when we revised an SCR to a reverse total shoulder, you can see this piece of skin looks no different than what it did seven years ago, except it has calcium on it. And under this microscope, it showed us no new neovascularization, complete calcification, but it's still skin. So what are we really offering these patients utilizing dermal graft for these patients? What about balloon interposition? So in these particular patients, you have to find that they have a lower demand. And in these, it's a very simple procedure, but you must make sure that they have an intact subscapularis. And this is almost real time. It's very simple to do. You come in, it can be done with two portals, measure the distance from your glenoid to the uh, tuberosity, and then put the balloon in. And once that balloon, that sheath is removed, fill it up. And what we'll see is that you have the superior migration, which is restored to a better position, restoring that force couple within the glenohumeral joint, allowing for better range of motion. But again, we must have an intact subscapularis. So that brings us to tendon transfer with the lower trapezius versus the latissimus dorsi. The arthroscopic assist in the lower trap is very helpful in these patients because it gives us the, a way to help these irreparable tears of the posterior superior rotator cuff. We must also have a repairable or good subscapularis. And then these patients often do better when they have less function, meaning if they have an, a lag sign in external rotation, these do very well. And what we do is we can tie this in with one type of graph. In non-allograph um, countries, we can use a semi-tendinosis semi autograph, but in, in the U.S., we've been using Achilles allograph. And these are not all repairable tears, so in these irreparable tears, this is a great option. Why? Because this particular tendon is a large tendon coming from a large muscle that has a restorative action in the same direction as the infraspinatus that's torn. So why is it helpful? Because it has excursion and tension. It is expandable in the same direction that we, uh, in the same line of pull as the infraspinatus, and it's going to restore that one function we want. It's fairly simple. It can be arthroscopic assisted. Uh, it has better restoration of the shoulder biomechanics, and there's the ease of postoperative training and transfer because, it, like I said, it goes in the same direction. The lat dorsi, though, it can be used. Although it's not as robust, it's not as thick, and therefore, in a third of these patients, they go on to become arthritic. These conversations that these are bridging procedures are becoming less likely when you're using the lower trap versus the latissimus dorsi. Head-to-head, -head, it showed that they had good results, although the lower trap did better, uh, it, because this was an in-phase versus out-of-phase transfer. And then the problem is there's no uh, pedicle with a lower trap, so you don't have to worry about injuring the uh, blood vessel. So in these, Al Hassan talked to us about this back in 07, and in, it's very easy to find. Once you make this small incision, you look for the fat. Right under the fat, you'll find this tendon, and then once you hook that tendon, you can attach your graft to it and put it up in the uh, shoulder. This is one of our patients. Here he is uh, roughly six months out. It's in his right shoulder, and so you can see he externally rotates a little bit because he needs... He doesn't have a supra, so as it comes up, it externally rotates because it's, you're attaching it around the side, but it does help with forward flexion as well.
In these patients, they do better when they're uh, greater than 60 degrees of uh, preoperative function, if they have an external rotation lag sign, and so it is an excellent opportunity for these patients. We're running out of time, so I'll just go ahead. But this is uh, in... Can I, can I have one slide? Okay. So in, in, in finishing, I'll just say that if you have the opportunity to fix it, fix it. If you can't fix it, try thinking of the best option for biology for these patients in order to give them their best opportunity. You, in those ones that are truly irreparable, in the younger patient without arthritis, I believe that a lower trapezius transfer is probably our best option versus if they're older, then the, one of the better options would be a replacement. Thank you.